President Duda, it's a real privilege to have you here today. Uh, we welcome you to the stand and provide the opening remarks. Thank you. Good afternoon, Excellencies, Ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. I'm glad that we are meeting this year once again, this time in the Three Seas Hub, to discuss major security challenges facing NATO's eastern flank. We are meeting after the Vilnius Summit and before another an anniversary one in Washington, D.C. It is a good moment to reflect on how NATO should adapt to the current situation in order to ensure security and peace to our citizens. Ladies and gentlemen, the contemporary security architecture established after the Second World War and significantly transformed after the collapse of the Soviet Union is changing once again. The security model created by us and based on the UN Charter and on the provisions enshrined in the final act of the Conference of Security and Cooperation in Europe is wasted. And and we have to be clear about it. Despite the fact that most of our countries have been building and maintaining friendly relations with their neighbors and making joint efforts to resolve any emerging crises and conflicts, there were also those for whom the principles of respect for sovereignty and equality of states or the inviolability of the borders are just void provisions. Provisions which they additionally decided to erase by force. Today, after nearly two years of Russian full-scale aggression against Ukraine, only the foolish or naive fail to see the real threat that is the Russian Federation and its imperial policy. Moscow's plans do not end in Ukraine. The aggression carried out by Russia for so many months demonstrates that Russia has the capabilities to rebuild its military potential up to a level which possess a real threat to the alliance, and especially to its members on the eastern flank. Ladies and gentlemen, NATO has to clearly demonstrate its strength. Today, collective defense provided for in Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty has to stand for reliability, immediate action, strength, and unity. Potential aggressors, including especially Russia, can have no doubts that an attack on NATO countries has no chance of success. In order to achieve that, we must urgently focus on a few key issues. First of all, it will require the maintenance of a permanent and strong allied presence, in particular in the eastern flank countries. Secondly, the Alliance should keep updating its defense plans, possess and as assigned forces prepared to execute such plans, APS facilities in strategically important locations, as well as the common structure adapted to challenges resulting from the large and high intensity land operation. Thirdly, we should construct robust logistic and infrastructure, including fuel supply system for the troops on the eastern flank. Major military bases in Central Europe should be connected by a network of allied pipelines, just like the major military bases in Western Europe. 
Fourthly, we should develop and integrate a joint missile defense system. Today, Russian missiles pose a threat not only for Ukraine. Poland knows it very well, since as a frontline state, we have experienced this kind of threat directly. There is a long list of tasks facing NATO. Every member of the Alliance should also remember to fulfill their duties, ensuring the relevant level of defense spending and developing own national capabilities. All of this will have its experience, but if we fail to act in this way, the Allied defense and deterrence policy will not save us from Ruski Mir. Ladies and gentlemen, I can assure you that Poland will actively contribute to the implementation of Allied deterrence and defense. We are in the process of an unprecedented modernization of our armed forces. We are purchasing new combat aircraft, tanks, missile defense equipment, artillery systems, and many other military capabilities. We are increasing the size of our armed forces and reopening military bases in the eastern part of the country. We also present in the territories of our allies. Our troops are deployed today in Latvia and Romania, among others. We regularly police air spies, airspace of the Baltic states and Slovakia. In 2023, we allocated around 4% of our GDP for defense. It seems to be much, but the security of our citizens is most important. Unless all of us enhance our capabilities and allocate at least 2% of GDP for defense, the Allied deterrence and defense policy will not fulfill its role. And without it, the costs will be much higher for the Eastern flank in particular, but also for, for NATO as a whole. Thank you, and I wish you an interesting discussion. I'm Ian Brzezinski. I'm a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. It's a privilege to uh, moderate discussion on NATO. And let me start by thanking President Duda uh, for his presence here and for his very hard-hitting remarks. I have to say, I, I have to repeat some of his priorities because I think they're important. He warned us the international order is under challenge today, particularly here in Europe. And he called for response and include increased military presence of allies in Central and Eastern Europe, the frontier states, the three seas countries. He called for an adaptation of war, plan, war plans. He called for joint air and missile defense. And he also called for logistical improvements, the infrastructure that flows fuel, that moves, high, that moves trucks, that moves trains. You know, this is the heart and soul of three Cs, which is all about inf infrastructure development. So, Mr. Mr. President, thank you for setting the context of, of this discussion. Let me also thank BGK and uh, their team for hosting the three Cs hub here and getting partnership to the Atlantic Council and developing our three C's agenda over this last week, of which this event is a culminating event. And how can you beat that? Uh, how, how can you better that than having uh, the president of Poland kick off our, our discussion? The, 
president noted a very dangerous context that we face ourselves in today. It's also a, a context that's going to include two very important anniversaries or events that are coming up this year, uh, 2024. In April, NATO will celebrate its 75th anniversary. Uh, and in July, NATO allies, heads of state, including President Duda, will, will convene in Washington for a summit that will mark that anniversary and address these challenges. You know, as we approach these dates, it's not just the context of, of Russian belligerence that's going to shape that anniversary and shape the summit, I would argue shape the alliance's the future. It's also violence in the Middle East. It's tensions in the Indo-Pacific. We've even had some tensions in the Balkans these last weeks, among other challenges. But I have to say, it's the war that Russia has started, this unjust, brutal attack on Ukraine, that's really going to define this anniversary. It's really going to define NATO's future. These challenges are an in, uh, increasing array of threats that are redefining the requirements of effective deterrence and defense. And these requirements pertain to some of the things the President noted. Military capabilities, the deployment of those capabilities, defense industrial ca capacities necessary to sustain what are now is the reality of high intensity conflict. Over the last 75 years, NATO has been the world's most successful alliance. But does it have what it needs? Is it doing what it needs to be done to ensure that it is equally unmatched and successful in the next 75? So to address these issues, we have a great panel here. We have people on the front lines of NATO, so to speak, at the NAC, three permanent representatives. I'm not going to or introduce them in order of seniority, but I'm going to start with, with Poland, Ambassador Tomasz Otowski. He's been in his post as a permanent representative of NATO since 2019. He served across national security positions in defense industry, the Prime Minister's Chancellery in Poland, the Ministry of Defense. And I have to say, as, as, a, sec as a Deputy Minister of Defense, he ran one of the most aggressive and substantive strategic reviews and I really commend you for that. In the center, we have Ambassador Peter Bator. He's, a, he's, been, he's permanent representative of Slovakia to, uh, to NATO. He's been a policy advisor and speechwriter for two presidents and too many ministers to, to, to mention. This is his second tour at NATO. He served the DCM, the deputy chief of mission there. And he's had a number of field uh, assignments for his country in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and in Kosovo. And Yuri Lulik, Ambassador Yuri Lulik, I, I held you last even though you're, I think you're the senior uh, permanent representative in, at, at NATO, but your resume includes serving in that position two times, three times if you include Estonia's representation when it, was a, when it was a partner. You've been a member of parliament, ambassador to the United States, ambassador to Russia, minister of defense three times, but minister of foreign affairs only once. I have to ask why. <laughs> but welcome, gentlemen. Let me start off with what kind of a very basic, basic question. The, uh, over, the, over the last several months, over the course of the war that Russia has embarked against Ukraine, it's become a mantra to say that NATO has become stronger. Uh, NATO is more unified than ever before. But is it really strong enough? Is it really demonstrating the political will to, to use the capabilities it has decisively? to ensure our security today and to ensure our, our security tomorrow. Thomas, let me start with you. Thank you very much, Ian. Let me start by saying that it's an enormous pleasure to be here uh, once again uh, and an honor to be in the presence of um, uh, uh, Mr. President and my distinguished colleagues. Getting back to the question, um, uh, to, uh, to answer um, uh, your, your question, um, uh, I would like to recall the 24th of February two years ago. Basically, when we walked into the council, it was, I think, 8.30, some of the council it was uh, at 8.30 after the Russian attack. Uh, we had a, one of the shortest uh, se um, uh, sessions of the North Atlantic Council, and one of the most decisive one, ones, because this was the council where, for the first time, NATO enacted, uh, put into action its operational plans. Uh, so one could say uh, NATO really passed the exam, and indeed, be because of that experience, this is one of the reasons I, I more, I trust more in NATO than I than I uh, used to before coming to 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 serving uh, my country in the in the alliance. At the same time, the road to that to that moment was was a bit painful, and only I think only my colleagues know. I mean, the the the, the number of dreadful discussions, the 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 how um, uh, we were trying to actually put 
the alliance more on the alert, p you know, um, perhaps introduce the plans earlier so that we are we, we are prepared uh, better. And we didn't fully succeed be before because there was still a number of uh, um, colleagues, um, uh, or actually the capitals, who thought that it would be provocative. I think, in our view, it was it was uh, it was a mistake. Anyway, I mean, I would say the alliance passed the 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 exam, but there's still work to do, and there's still need for a vigilance to make sure that the uh, alliance r responds um, uh, um, appropriately to the challenges. Mm -hmm. Peter, are we? Does the alliance have the war fighting mindset? War fighting mindset necessary to really be decisive against the challenges that the alliance is facing today. Yeah, l let me also start by thanking Mr. President and, and also the Atlantic Council for the for the invitation. It is really an honor and privilege to be here again after a year. On the on the mindset, yeah, just what what Somash just said. I think it, and, and you as well. I mean, in, in, in very short, I think the alliance is is the strongest and and the best prepared with the best ever developed plans. I mean, in in the history and and with the highest number of uh, member states that the alliance has ever had who are sharing the same values but also the same understanding what to do should an attack uh, uh, against one or more of its members uh, um, uh, happen and 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 this is uh, and I really mean it and this is very important and this is uh, this is very important starting point uh, and many things are really I mean far beyond the expectations of course uh, not not everything is perfect and I would maybe say it's not only about the alliance because the alliance is only as strong as the societies and the whole system and I think that the that what we are coping now with is is to get back the muscle memory. And this might be a bit controversial, but I think what we need to do, and, and many states, and, and Poland in the forefront of it, is we need to come back somehow to the Cold War uh, mindset. Basically, we, we, do, we, we don't need to expect war, but we have to be prepared for it. We have to be ready to defend. And, and it means not only to have politicians who are brave to take uh, certain decisions, but you have to have, and you mentioned it, the defense sector that should switch much faster to understand that there, there is a threat. And if there is a threat, we, we, we do not have the comfort of waiting for two or three years and find some stimulus or something for them. We do not have uh, the, uh, the comfort just maybe to say, okay, we have forces, maybe 10% of them may be allocated somewhere. I mean... Just imagine that the same situation would happen during the Cold War. We would have, at if not uh, tens of thousands of forces on the uh, German uh, uh, Czech border, maybe hundreds of thousands. If something like uh, what, what happened in Ukraine in, in, uh, in 23 would happen, I don't know, something in, in, in the 70s or 80s. Now the reaction was very light, and I think the muscle memory, and we are gaining it, and, and sorry, maybe a maybe few, few, few more words. Uh, I, I always try to find some... Uh, concrete examples from from normal life, you know, uh, like the runners. You know, we we may have been uh, great runners in the past, and then for 15 years we did not run, and now we decided let's run again. So what you need to do, you need to start running. It's painful, and you know, but if you want to compete again, you have to change your diet, you have to increase uh, the mileage, and and you basically you have to be running almost every day. We, and 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 first you have to get up from your sofa and, and turn off the TV. We we already start running. Some of the countries, like the Baltic countries, Poland already added extra miles, but we still eat pizza in the evening. And it's so painful, you know, to get rid of the pizza and instead of that to get up and to go running. And I think what we need to do, not only to, 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 start, uh, to stop eating pizza, to change the diet, to add the extra miles and to do it every day. And I think we're still somewhere, I mean, as, as, as a group of states, the 31 as a collective, I mean, we're still somewhere with, okay, I'd rather have the pizza because this is my comfort for the evening and not running when it's raining outside. Let me build on this and, and turn to Yuri because I feel sometimes I'm bipolar on, on NATO. At the same time, on the positive side, I see improvements are being made, in, being made. The new defense and deterrence strategy, the new war fighting plans, the increase in defense spending. You know, we have 40,000 Americans deployed across, across Central, Central Europe specific to respond to the challenge by Russia. But at the same time, here we are two years into this war. We have an alliance that has a combined GDP of 42, 42 trillion, 44 trillion dollars. Russia has a GDP of maybe 1.2 trillion dollars. The alliance has, you know, a defense combined defense budget of 1.2 trillion dollars. Russia has a defense budget, at least a year or two ago, was about 88, 90 uh, billion dollars. How is it that the alliance isn't squashing, helping Ukraine squash Ru Russia in, in in this kind of geopolitical, geoeconomic balance? Is that a reflection 
of a lack of will on the part of the West, on part of NATO? Uh, lack of will is, of course, a serious problem. But let me start by uh, making a couple of points about Russia, because uh, it is clear that President Putin wanted to conquer Ukraine very quickly, perhaps within 10 days, three weeks. Uh, he wanted to use only certain parts of the military and not to use at all or, or change or influence the civil society. Then he found out that this is impossible. He needs a society which is militarized, which is simple, which is like, you know, soldiers uh, fighting behind him. And he has changed his society. And uh, that's a big challenge because democracies can never change societies like that. We cannot fight with Putin changing our societies to Putinesque uh, societies. So we have to find strength in our own system, in the democratic system, which would allow us to face uh, Putin. And we could do it. But I don't think the political leaders, with the exception of uh, people like President Duda and others on the eastern flank of NATO, have really shifted their mindset to explain to their own people why this is important. When I look at uh, you know, TV programs, our leaders, uh, political leaders, especially in Western Europe, they are talking of so many important things, uh, uh, green technology, changes in education. This is all very important. If you pick one of these issues and ask me, aha, Yuri, you don't think environment is important, then of course I have to say, obviously it's important. But if I ask myself, what is the biggest challenge of these generations which are sitting here in the room. It's this war, Russian war with Ukraine. So we have to change the mindset, explain to our own people why this is important. And then the kind of the strength, the inner strength of a democratic society hopefully sort of comes together and uh, helps us. Because we have advantages everywhere technology, finances, industrial capabilities, everywhere you look. But of course, we also have to understand that, and here I come back to, to, to NATO, uh, one of the questions is, I mean, we also need to change our approach in understanding warfare. I mean, Putin has found out that his strength is in volume. His strength is in volume, his strength is in huge amounts of soldiers and officers he is ready to send uh, to the trenches and get killed. This is something which is so difficult to understand for a civilized society. And this will be something which is a challenge for NATO forces. I mean, we, we are talking about massive, if you will, killing fields. It's, it, it's a big psychological challenge. How will we fight that? How will we fight that first world or second world war type battle? I think that is something we have to grapple with and find uh, proper answers. Yuri, that is a profound statement, and it's a reminder of how brutal this war is and how unprepared, I think, mentally we are uh, when it comes down to the, the realities of what we've, we've returned to, high-intensity conflict. Let me add, uh, Pedro, is NATO doing enough to support Ukraine? Should it be doing more? And here I'm talking about the alliance. Yeah. Look, I mean, there was... There was this decision of NATO that it would not uh, support uh, Ukraine militarily. This is the starting point in which I, 
uh, and against many, uh, many, many other opinions, which I still don't believe in. I mean, that was then was one of the tests for the alliance, and I understand all the reasons why we did not do that. But when we speak about NATO helping the alliance, and I always try to involve the bilateral uh, assistance because NATO is not only the organization, the building, but it's 31 nations. But if you if you ask only about about the alliance, then you know the beginning of the conflict, the first two years, basically one and a half years, uh, it was a non-military assistance by by the political military organization. If you just you know write this into book and if you read it, and if you are 18 years old in in I mean a kid. In, in 20 years, you know, uh, and if my grandchildren come to me and say, you were sitting there, just explain me, you know, you were the, the most powerful military organization in the world and you decided not to militarily support Ukraine. Please explain this to me. I, I, w I would have difficulties. I, I, I can find many good arguments. I mean, if I was in a, a th theoretical uh, rhetoric battle, but if, I, if it comes to real policy, me, myself, I still have problems, just, just to explain to myself. Uh, although I know the arguments, that's the first thing. Second, there's still a lot, uh, a lot, uh, or many things to do. And where NATO is is, is the best is is the military planning. It's the uh, it's it, it, it's the uh, NATO what we call the NATO defense planning process, which is like how to put all the things together, including what what Yuri just mentioned, just that that the whole that the whole thing would make sense. And this is what Ukraine needs, uh, maybe not immediately right now, but it needs for the years to come, because this is the only guarantee for Ukraine. It will be able first to defend itself, but also to meet the standards to become NATO member. And, and there should be no question whether or not Ukraine should, should, should become a NATO member. So I think this is one of the most important things now that, that, that NATO can do in the longer term. In the short term, there is many programs, you know, uh, financial support, buying things that are of non-military nature, which is still, I mean, in that, in that basket, like military uh, organization helping, uh, help, helping, uh, helping Ukraine. There are many other programs, but I think this is, this is the core of it. Tomas, would you want to add to that? Are there more things that NATO could be doing to support Ukraine? I'm totally with Peter on this on this issue. Uh, uh, it's not, a, uh, I think, also not a secret that Poland has been advocating for a more robust role for the alliance because indeed th this seems to be an artificial Chinese wall. In fact, the alliance is, of course, affecting the war, for instance, by protecting the territories of, of, of countries that are critical to uh, supporting Ukraine. And the fact that they critical uh, supply routes are being protected by the alliance or of course makes sense you know the fact that um, some of the non lethal training is is taking part within nato does have a role but of course i mean there's i think there's no better way and let me let me explain by the following um in the wake of the invasion um the, the, there was a decision to establish an ad hoc mecha mechanism the ramstein group and I think this, was, of course, was the right uh, move. We needed some sort of something flexible, you know, to get together and everything. Uh, but then, as the war is entering the third year, you know, we need something long term. We need a structure that will allow us, first of all, to understand what is the picture. We sometimes have problem in understanding the picture. You know, what, I mean, what are our capacities, uh, joint capacities, in terms of how we can support Ukraine vis-à-vis -vis the Russian uh, ones? This is one. Second, how we can perhaps better organize our, ourselves um, uh, so that supporting Ukraine will cease to be the beauty context, uh, contest and will be more uh, efficient, more, uh, more long term. So I, I don't think there's any other organi organization that could do it better than NATO. Otherwise, if, it, if it's not the case, we would need to somehow structure the, Rams the Ramstein process, make it more, uh, make it more structured, yeah. Yuri? Let me just add to colleagues, I entirely agree with them. Uh, I think the, f the first point I would like to make is that, uh, of course, for NATO's existence and for NATO's credibility, the victory of Ukraine is crucial. Because it's not that when Ukraine loses, it's not only that Russia moves closer to us, it's also that West will show its weakness. West will make it absolutely visible to everybody that it's weak. And that will harm our deterrent strongly, because our deterrent is based on the idea of strength. And if we cannot manage that in Ukraine, then we'll all be in great difficulties. I very much agree with the fact that uh, the 
uh, assistance to Ukraine has been very ad hoc, uh, not very well planned. And NATO could be a superb organization to handle that. With one caveat, we would have to build the mechanism which does not allow endless debates. I mean, we are all members of the North Atlantic Council. We have participated in endless debates. And assistance should be quick, effective, uh, responsive to Ukrainian needs. So NATO should actually think of the ways where we can actually guarantee that. And we do not bureaucratize the whole assistance process. That's important. You made a very important point, which is tying NATO's future, NATO's credibility, which ultimately is its future, to the outcome of this war. And you know, I think in the first months after the, the invasion, the second invasion, or the second phase of the invasion of Ukraine back in February of 2022, you could make the case that Ukraine's not a NATO member. Uh, and so therefore, NATO's credibility is at stake. But I think as we approach the 75th anniversary, after $200 million, $200 billion in largely NATO country assistance, after multiple summit meetings and ministerials in which we've asserted that you know, Russia must be defeated, if Ukraine loses this, I think NATO's uh, future, its credibility is going to be severely, severely damaged. damaged. Well, Tomas, let me go back to you and ask a question, because you're a, not just a policymaker, but you've also been a, 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 a leader of an institute. You've been a, a, a thinker on defense and deterrence. Has Putin been able to effectively exercise nuclear coercion to keep NATO from doing more? And is that setting a dangerous precedent, not only for NATO, but perhaps for stability well beyond Europe? Um, I would uh, perhaps frame uh, the answer a little bit uh, differently. Um, I think that the response to different impulses that we receive from Moscow has been the way we manage the escalation. So basically manage the escalation through different deployments, through the posture of our forces, but also through um, um, uh, uh, sort of apportioning our support to, to Ukraine. And perhaps I think we all agree right now that perhaps we were overly cautious in the course of the war. Let me just recall that had we been more generous, more forthcoming in 2022, perhaps the war would, uh, would, would be in a, in a different place. The Ukrainians would be in a much stronger position and perhaps uh, you know, that, that could lead to, a, uh, to the end of, of the conflict uh, being, being closer to, to us and on, and on more just um, uh, terms. So indeed, I, mean, I, I would say we've, we've been too cautious in, term, in terms of in navigating in, in, this, in, this, in this conflict. Mm -hmm. My colleagues? Would you yeah, of course, the decisions are always taken in some, uh, yeah, they are not taken isolated environment. There were so many unknowns that, you know, uh, and that was a political decision to, to play it more, uh, I would say, more cautiously than, than well, if we look now in retrospective, maybe was was too much. Uh, that, that, that's, that's the first point. Second, Putin failed in many, many ways. I mean, he had his perfect plans and almost all of them are, uh, just went in vain. But there was one that worked very well. I think he knew pretty well that if he starts, you know, to 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 wrestle with nuclear weapons and all these threats, looking at the uh, and I, I mentioned the comfort of the of the West, that he knew that we would get so scared that maybe we we would not be that that brave as, as maybe otherwise we, we we could be. And I think one of this calculation in this calculation he was quite right, and we reacted exactly as as he expected. Maybe the third lesson from this is that if we have yet another conflict with anyone, especially power as as Russia still is, let us not define the red lines of the opponents without waiting for him to define the red lines. Because what we did was that we, draw, we drew the red lines which we thought Putin drew, and then we had our own difficulties to go over them, and only by time, which was by the way the most pressure, precious uh, uh, good at that time, we were just waiting and then we tried to you know, approach the red lines, then we tested it and then we found out, oh yeah, it's okay, it's, it's not a real red line. Let's try to test the other one, but in a few months. 
just a year ago, we had a big discussion here whether the West should deliver tanks to Ukraine. Now, this debate seems ridiculous. At that time, it was the most sensitive question that we got uh, sitting here uh, on, on, on the same spot. So, and basically, it took us so much time just to approach the red lines, and we somehow forgot that it was us who drew the red lines and not, not him. And I think this is one of the biggest mistakes that we did, that we sometimes try to thank for, for the others and imposing the threats on us without being imposed by the other side. Projecting our values on, on our adversaries. And speaking of adversaries, let me turn to Yuri again. Tell me, what do you think Putin's strategy is now? How, how have his objectives evolved? How has his strategy evolved over the last two years? Well, th there are different aspects to it, but, but let me focus on one of them. I think Putin has understood that first, as I said, he wants to change his own society. But second, he wants to put this war in a much wider context so that he wouldn't be forced to fight it alone, if you will. Uh, if he would simply say, look guys, I want Ukraine, and that's it. Then for other countries like uh, North Korea or Iran, that wouldn't be such an interesting prospect. But if he says, guys, I want to change the world order, look like you would like it to have, with spheres of influence, with favorable conditions to dictators, etc., etc. Because people often say, oh, Putin wants to change the world order. But it's always interesting to ask, in what way? And of course, the way which would be beneficial to dictators all over the world. He has, in a way, created a much larger movement, if you will. And, of course, uh, that's why Iran, North Korea are with him. There are, of course, transactional interests, you know, money, technology, etc., etc. But I don't think that's the main reason. So when one explains this like that, it becomes obvious how high the stakes are for democracies. Because if we are weak, democracies can actually lose the whole game, not lose only particular territories or, or particular geopolitical positions, but the whole game of how the world order is organized, the liberal world order will disappear. And it will be a world order with the face of Putin, or with Ayatollahs, or with Kim Il Jong. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I cannot resist just, just to say one more thing on, on the lessons learned that we, that we heard during our visit in Congress in the US. And that was, you know, on the escalation management and everything. And it was very simple truth and said, you know, just name one conflict which was won without escalating on the side of the good forces. So, I mean, next time when we hear about escalation, just remember if we just keep what it's right now there, we would never, uh, we would never succeed because if we do not escalate, we simply cannot win. Yeah, it's not escalation avoidance, it's escalation management, which uh, should be exercised. One of the steps that the Alliance is taking uh, to enhance and strengthen this posture is the effectuation of a, a new strategy that was rolled out a couple of years ago and approved by heads, heads of state. And if I have it right, it's the, uh, the, the concept for deterrence and defense in the Euro-Atlantic area. And, but this is a document that hasn't been released publicly. Um, it's a document upon which now war plans are being developed and will likely be approved at the upcoming summit. You're all on the inside. You're in the star chamber. You're, you, you're, you're in, this, in, in the secret room, and you can see this. For those of us on the outside, particularly for the three seas countries who are on the frontier of, of, of this conflict, how will they know that something's different because of the implementation of the strategy? What will they see? What will our adversaries see uh, that comes from this strategy and the war plans that will be approved? What's the tangible side that will be visible and touchable uh, from, from these documents, from these plans, that will give us confidence the alliance is ready for for whatever it faces. Tomas? Yeah, sure. Um, 
I think that the most tangible uh, thing that an observer that doesn't have an access to classified information should see when we succeed in uh, resourcing the plants, because plants are, have been approved by the heads of states and government already in Vilnius, and the question is about resourcing them with the pr proper pool of forces, uh, providing uh, appropriate um, um, uh, reinforcement uh, uh, concept, uh, providing, um, uh, I mean, uh, adjusting the common control structure, all, all those things. But uh, the most tangible thing would be a certain um, um, logic in terms of the uh, exercises. Basically, how we exercise, how we deploy, will be, will be driven by the logic of those defense plans. So th there will be co a cohesion be our, between our peacetime activities uh, and possibly uh, wartime, God forbid, but if we, if we have to go into the conflict. So for instance, uh, you should see uh, same units exercising in uh, in same areas because they should know the, the, the prescri prescribed areas of responsibilities. We are going away from the logic of the, of, of the previous era, where we were assuming that our, just a small portion of our, of our um, uh, forces is in high readiness, and they are ready to act uh, anywhere, because in fact that w they were meant to act outside of the area of, the, uh, of, of, of alliance. Nobody was speaking, nobody was thinking seriously about the defense of the alliance territory. Now we have to master all of our forces. They need to know where they will be needed in, in times of the war. They need to practice, uh, practice that. So that's, that, that should be visible in, uh, in peacetime uh, activities. And, but there, I mean, we are marching there, but it's, it's still a ch challenge because indeed it, it requires, for instance, giving up some of the national control. So for instance, it requires that we will assign our forces to the control of the Supreme uh, Allied Commander, and, s and this process isn't always going, going smoothly. But much of that will be kind of hidden from public view. I mean, will we be seeing larger scale exercises? Will we be seeing snap exercises? Will they not be occurring just in Western Poland, but on in Eastern Poland, in, in, in Estonia, in Romania, no notice exercises, uh, you know, more for, a more forceful presence in the Black Sea, if not in the Arctic. Will we be seeing that as a consequence of this, uh, of this new strategy? Go ahead, Yuri. Just to start with, uh, we, we will be seeing a number of large exercises. And of course, these exercises, as Thomas said, already are sort of exercising the plans. So if you are an expert and you look at the exercise, you broadly also understand what the plan is. And that's how it's supposed to be. Because as Thomas said, we have to exercise how we fight. I mean, this should be the same. Now, the other very good sort of indicator is also what the countries are purchasing. Because we know now broadly the parameters of war and the huge risks we are having. So if I look at what Poland has purchased, it is absolutely clear, and which Poland will be purchasing, it's absolutely clear that this is responsive. It's responsive to the current risks, to the current needs. If I look at the um, purchasing uh, lists of some other countries, I won't name them, then it's absolutely clear that they are not taking this acute risk seriously. And for them, buying stuff is more about commercial interest, you know, buying from their own factory, providing jobs, rather than buying stuff which is necessary, which is clearly warranted. And let's be honest, we have to buy it from everywhere around the world. For instance, Estonia is buying uh, South Korean howitzers, Poland is buying South Korean howitzers, because they are good, they are relatively cheap, they are available, which is very important, because a lot, lot of uh, very fancy stuff is not available. You cannot buy it only after five years, perhaps. Uh, so, so that's the... Uh, that, that, that's something which can be seen from those uh, purchase lists. And finally, you mentioned SNAP exercises. I think this is something we are lacking because 
the readiness is shown best not by exercises which are pre-planned a long time, and you can really arrange your troops, raise them to an appropriate level, then move them. I mean, it takes, you know, big exercise, it takes year to plan, two years might be. For instance, in Estonia, we do snap exercises because we have a reserve army. So basically, you will get a call which says, basically, drop everything. You are being asked to join your battalion number this and that, and you have to be there in six hours. And people come. And we have done it now many, many times. And this is real stuff. This is real warfare. So um, I would advise all NATO countries to try SNAP exercises because they are the best proof whether this actually works. Just wanted to add, if I may. Uh, indeed, I wanted to 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 to, to um, uh, bring up the Estonian example. Uh, last year, I was indeed able to uh, to to visit, uh, thanks to Yuri, uh, the Estonian national exercise, and indeed, it is remarkable how how the system is organized, and we can we can take. Um, I mean, we we can follow this model. I think to some extent in Poland, we've done it with the Territorial Defense Force, which indeed has one of the highest uh, levels of of readiness, but. To another good point made by Yuri on the on the purchases, I would like uh, I would uh, like to say that it's not just quality, but I would say first of all the quantity. I think that we got the we had gotten the quantity aspect of our readiness very much uh, wrongly uh, before. And uh, I myself, even though I, I was I, I was saying that even when I was when I was um, uh, in charge of drafting the strategic defense review, I think still I. I Looking backwards, uh, I, uh, looking back, I I think uh, uh, even I un underestimated the the challenge as, as it um, pertains to the ammunition stockpiles, for uh, for instance. So, if countries are not changing radically their approach to those issues, indeed, those countries are, are not taking seriously the the threats that we are facing. Peter? Yeah, a, a very good question from your side. And one of, one of the biggest challenges with the plan, surprisingly, maybe is not to draft them and maybe to execute them, but to try to find language that in, in, in plain speak would explain to people what they really are. We've been coping with this, and, and your question, even our answers, are also a good demonstration. You know, this is this is so complex. I mean, when I compare them, and I really, they, they are the most advanced plans probably that have ever been developed on, on this earth. And uh, when I compare them to the previous plans, and I will use the example of Estonia, just not to speak about other countries who are not here, I mean, if Putin did one another miscalculation, I think he, I mean, if he wanted to scare us totally, and of course, God forbid that would ever happen, but instead of attacking Ukraine in 2014, he had to uh, attack, I don't know, Estonia. Because based on those points, when I see the biggest difference is the readiness of forces, but also when I will come, what are the signs of, of the new plans? I think we would most probably not be able to defend Estonia from the very first minute and, and, and every centimeter of, of its territory. And we would have so many buchas, you know, on the Allied territory just based on those points because we were enjoying the comfort so much. Now it's totally different. And and uh, yeah, the first sign, and uh, my colleagues already mentioned that it's it's the forces in place, you know, that that's the that's the easy sign. That's the equipment, as it, uh, as it was said. It's also temporal increase in numbers of forces. When we say it's not, you know, any, uh, any secret, we will train and we will exercise, you know, how to, how to increase the numbers, I don't know, from, from the battle group to, uh, to brigade, maybe even over it, but all the structures, so people will, will see it. Then another thing that, that might be visible is the improvement of infrastructure, something that has been really under-resourced uh, under for so many years, because you may have the best forces on your territory, but if you're not able to get the the other forces very quickly to reinforce and, and you know just to settle down to eat something to sleep somewhere to use the warehouses and everything these forces will not be able to fight and that's the ammunition as well I mean that's I mean th this is very complex it is not that sexy it's not that visible 
but it's much more important even than the numbers on, on the spot. So, and, and, and you know, th this, this is the complex of all the plans. The biggest difference now is that not only that we have the forces, and as Mr. President said, permanent presence on the, eastern, uh, on the eastern flank, but also that we have forces ready in other allied states being ready to come, I don't know, within three days. Not like, you know, when something happens, then we would sit down and discuss who would, you know, uh, provide the forces, who would provide the logistics now. The new system is that when I need the forces, they will be there immediately, and the states must be ready for that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll try maybe, because indeed, I, I've noticed that for many people who, uh, who, who do not have the insight for like day-to-day -day business within NATO, the actual state of the alliance, it's kind of difficult to, to grasp the, the, the scale of this revolution that happened within uh, recent years, because they are like speaking about the, hearing about the plans, about the forces, and they, I think their reaction is, isn't that what the alliance should be about? And the answer is, is indeed, I mean, the scale of the, of, of the achievement is big because, not because of, of that we've come up with something new. The scale of the achievement is big because of, of how far we were from, we actually, actually we, we should realize how far we were from, from being an effective alliance throughout the years from the end, uh, end of the 90s till 2014. Indeed, we demilitarized ourselves. It was an alliance without a military strategy an alliance where you had to exert an enormous pressure in, it, in, in order to get an ev even like notional defense um, uh, plans where only small fraction of forces has been exercising to, uh, to, to conduct some, uh, some um, uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, to, uh, to be on a higher readiness. And when actually around 2014, actually it was fall 2013, when we had first exercise that, that after many years that was devoted to, to collective defense, its scale was was 1,300. Was was this is just ju just negligible. So this is how how come we far now. You know that we are conducting exercises on a scale of tens of thousands. We are conducting them according to plans, and we are again trying to resource all the might of uh, of all the all the others. Something that the uh, effective alliance uh, should be should be doing. Let me move on a little bit because I've got one other question to and I want to open up the audience. But this is an important point, and uh, uh, you know, when President Duda and his uh, fellow heads of state of NATO convene in Washington, this will be one of the, I understand, one of the big ro deliverables. Is we've heard more in this conversation about the DDA than I've heard over the last two years from, from the outside. I think it has to be a, a real effort by the alliance to articulate some of the things you've been saying. So when this is rolled out in, in, in July in Washington, it's understood by the publics and above all, understood by our adversary. With that being one of the deliverables, what I'd like to ask is, what should be the other deliverables in the Washington summit? Yeah, it's, I mean, you know, we, when, we, when we look at the deliverables, first we always look at our own security. And just one remark on, on the DDA and the plans is, why we are doing this, and one of the biggest deliver deliverables for the, for, for the summit in Vilnius, but also for the summit in Washington is, you know, Russia doesn't read the papers, and they don't need to read it. I mean, if we want to persuade Russia that and uh, and, and deter it from from any uh, any attack or any attempt to attack us, they they need to be convinced they have no chance, and they need to see that. And this this is this is the outcome of the summits of every summit to show it. You know, you have no chance. Whatever you try, you have no chance, and you can see it. it's the snap exercise in everything. Of course, the uh, num number two. Uh, 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 with, with, with a big surprise is Ukraine. Uh, we, I think we changed the mindset in, in the alliance uh, in Vilnius uh, because until then the 2008 decision from Bucharest was like, yes, it's there, one day Ukraine would become NATO member. It was more like a folklore than, uh, than a real policy. What we, and, and what you really could experience if you were sitting in the room is like how many states were really convinced that now Ukraine really embarked on the path towards the membership. There, there, there were many states in the alliance who just respected the policy or just took, took note of it, but have never supported it real. And I mean, at that table, there was a lot of support. And this is, I mean, they, I would call it the, the first steps of the final stage of Ukraine, uh, step, uh, Ukraine's way towards NATO membership. 
and and we need to we need to build build on it not only on the paper and not only discussing you know whether we we could find yet another stronger language or, or, or having discussions about about the invitation but it should be a gradual process based on what ukraine is delivering and so what we hope and and we're quite certain that ukraine would come to the summit they will have concrete deliverables which would because there is a tasking uh, approved by the heads of state and government that you know uh, uh, when the conditions are met, we will be in a position to decide mm -hmm. what is what is the role of Ukraine and what is our role is just to bring to 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 the leaders to table that this is the facts, this is the progress, this is what we've done together. So leaders, please give us give us yet another instruction or, or tell us are you in uh, are you in place uh, to decide uh, about the invitation or about the membership. We, we would not do a good job if the leaders uh, come to Washington and look at us and say, based on what can we decide whether whether to extend invitation or whether to say you're not prepared. So this is, I mean, this is what we really need to work on on uh, towards the summit, and then would be one of the deliverables. Many others, I think. I, I want to follow up definitely yeah. on this because I have to say it's because of your countries and because of your presidents that we achieved something. The alliance achieved something that I hadn't seen in watching Ukraine's relationship. With, you, with NATO over 30 years. This was the largest degree of support for Ukraine's aspirations I've ever seen, and it was largely because of Central European leadership on this issue, and I personally hope that will be the case again in the run-up to the Washington summit. But Yuri, I know you want to jump in, but let me ask you, do you see Ukrainian membership in NATO not only as a key to sustaining stability and peace after this war, but as part as a key element of the win strategy to help Ukraine win this war? I think it is part of the win strategy, and here's uh, how should I see it. Should be. Should be, and is. I think here's how I see it. Uh, I mean, Ukrainians are fighting for democracy, for their freedom. I mean, as you remember, the whole conflict with Russia started when uh, Ukrainians, when, when Yanukovych didn't want to sign the association agreement, uh, and uh, it led into a big revolution, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Ukrainians are fighting, in a way, for us and for our organizations. They are proud, they want to be proud members of the European Union, and we have given them a signal that we welcome them. They want to be members of NATO, it's absolutely clear why, and we have to give them a signal that we take their future membership seriously. And this is a signal which should run from Ukrainian president up to or down to trenches, where guys who are fighting would understand, look, a better society, a better company is waiting for you. I mean, you are just not fighting for nothing. You're fighting for your future. I think that is the signal which the Washington summit can give, and we'll be working with our uh, colleagues, with allies, uh, to find a proper way of, uh, of moving forward, to, to make a, a step forward. I would also very quickly come back to the defense and deterrence, because, um, I mean, just a side remark to Peter, Estonia is not the only country which is at risk. Yeah, I uh, mean, but I use all you because you're sitting thank here. You, thank you, thank you. Uh, but uh, as you said very well, I mean, when we started these debates in Madrid a couple of years ago, then the first move we made was to propose a new strategy, which was the strategy of forward defense. The strategy of forward defense was actually proposed by Central and Eastern Europe. Many in Western Europe, and even in the United States, were very skeptical about it. They told us, it's Cold War strategy, don't worry, we will come with our F-35s, we will shoot everybody, why are you dealing with this uh, uh, static uh, stuff with the armies? Aren't the armies uh, sort of... Uh, forgotten, are they, are they, aren't they a thing of the past? And we explain to people that this is not the case, that if you don't want puchas on your territory, 
you have to fight from the first meter. And for that, you need the army. In fact, uh, this conflict has revived the army as a branch of armed forces. Uh, and uh, for, for it, it has been very difficult because, it, especially in Western Europe, uh, armies were not a priority. People were focusing on very fancy air force, large ships, not the army. And, and finally, let me say this. The problem in Washington will be that we will make many important decisions when it comes to collective defense. But as you pointed out, none of it can be spoken about openly. I mean, this is all in secret documents, or most of it is in secret documents. One of the important projects which could be visible is the integrated air and missile defense, uh, what we call rotational model of uh, air and missile defense. Uh, that would be uh, a very important step forward because, as the president said, uh, protecting the air uh, is uh, is a key issue we see it now in Ukraine. Let me take a couple. We have just a few minutes left, so I want to take a couple questions from from the audience. Does anyone have any questions? Just raise your hand. And let me know. Mark Boris. Okay, I guess I'm I'm left with. Is there one back there? Yep. yep. So, uh, thank you. Let us hear know your name and please be concise and to the point. George, the question is, what happened with the old-fashioned nuclear deterrent strategy? Is it not enough? And uh, uh, if we look back, we see that NATO increased in the past uh, 30, 40 years and the adversary decreased by size and by capacity. So to repeat the question, isn't the nuclear deterrent enough at this stage? to prevent any escalation? It, I mean, it's clearly not enough, because uh, for nuclear deterrent, there has to be a belief that this will be used at any different scenarios. And it's clear it will not be used. Nukes will not be used. So the deterrent, nuclear deterrent as a strategy in that sense, is not credible. I mean, it's credible as a mean of strategic balance, but it's not credible on any particular territorial defense contingency. So we have to be flexible. Nuclear deterrent is important. But if we rely only on nuclear deterrent, then it's extremely weak. Tomas? I just fully agree with that. I mean, my question would be, to um, uh, um, a gentleman to ask the question, would you l like to be in a situation where to deter any uh, aggression, we always need to threaten with the nuclear Armageddon, the nuclear uh, actual destruction. It's critical, it's indispensable, but it's got to be backed um, and built on the f flexible uh, range of options from uh, conventional up to nuclear. Okay. Thank you. Any, uh, one more? I can't see you, unfortunately, I can see your hand. Um, Mr. Brezhnev and gentlemen, my name is Alexander, and um, um, the question is, um, what's uh, uh, NATO's uh, end goal towards this conflict? What is the end goal for this, in, in the uh, war between Russia and Ukraine? I mean, that NATO doesn't have an uh, official and uh, state, uh, because NATO is not part of the conflict. NATO, is, NATO as a group of countries is, of, co of course, obliged by the UN Charter, Article f f 51, to support the country th th that is uh, attacked. So, of course, this is, th this is to repel the uh, aggression and to make the, the defense uh, of the sovereignty of the territorial integrity of Ukraine uh, successful. That would be the one that I could try to, to derive. But of course, again, NATO doesn't state uh, its own its own objectives in the, in the conflict. But Thomas, let me push you a little bit and your colleagues jump in. I mean, I recognize the alliance is a consensus-based organization, so sometimes getting to full agreement is hard. But sitting from the outside, I think, can't one say it should be absolutely unambiguous that NATO ought to support Ukraine's war objectives, which is total territorial reconstitution? 
Because if you don't have total territorial reconstitution, you will have a war that will end it that will have rewarded aggression, will have rewarded a Putin, and that sets dangerous precedents. That should be the case. But uh, I mean, NATO doesn't have an. Uh, what I was referring to, NATO doesn't have an official strategy in this uh, in, uh, in this uh, conflict. We, as as countries of the international co community, we should uh, indeed be bound by this by this um, uh, objective. Yeah, my my personal opinion, but building on the NATO policies, because we stated that Ukraine should become NATO member. I think the goal for all of us is because we know that the best scenario for the future for, for, for the future years is that we would have some sort of cold war which was quite stable and quite safe in a way. And this is the best scenario by the way, not the worst one. Uh and, and there's 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 I mean one one uh, uh one factor that we need to that we need to make a reality that we need to have Ukraine in. So Ukraine needs to win this war in a way and, and it's also up to them to define uh, the victory, but in a way that we would be able to have Ukraine as a NATO member because this is the factor whether at our border I mean, the NATO's border, there would be a country which is NATO member, and then there would be a wall where could we send troops as, 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 as we used to or they used to do with Germany and, and the Czech Republic. Because if Ukraine is not in, then we would have the NATO border, and then we would have a large belt of instability, which would be absolute threat to our security, because that would, it would not be a stable Cold War, Cold War. It would be a lot of instability having Ukraine outside. So basically... Our end state should be to have Ukraine in NATO, and we ha we have to do everything possible for Ukraine to be able to become NATO member. Which, by the way, is a state of NATO policy, so we can actually yeah. say it, it, it is. Exactly. Well, to be totally honest about it, if you would ask every NATO member, you would probably get many different answers. Some of them are very nuanced, like uh, as long as necessary or to give Ukraine the best uh, position to negotiate. Some countries are saying that. Uh, I think the opinion of Eastern European countries, Poland, Baltic States, Slovakia, is very clear. I mean, victory means uh, uh, complete freedom to the Ukraine for the Ukrainian territory. It means NATO membership. It means uh, also... Uh, especially looking from NATO's point of view, it also means that we ourselves have uh, created what I would call policy of containment. Because Russia, even if Russia loses, its intentions will remain the same. So we need a long-term containment approach where NATO, of course, as during the Cold War, will play a very important role. But again, let's be honest, if we would use, if we are using the word containment in NATO corridors, not everybody is happy. Okay. So it's, it's, a, it's a work in progress. So I've got almost just a little over two minutes before we have to close. I want to go through one lightning round with the last question. What does NATO need to do or accomplish between now and July to ensure that this anniversary summit is one that will signal NATO's continued success in the future? Tomas? Well, uh, source the plans properly, uh, prove that we mean what we, what we said when it comes to deterrence and defense, send a strong signal that we are implementing what we promised to Ukraine in Bucharest and then in Vilnius, send also a strong uh, signal to the uh, entire world that we are uh, open for partnerships with countries from uh, other regions, like also in the Pacific, the countries that are, that are bound by, by yep. s uh, the similar values and similar um, um, perception of the of the of the world uh, order, and I think that would be that would be a successful summit. Yeah. Peter, and just building on what Tomas said, without repeating, just just to demonstrate, we really mean it for for everyone you know who's looking at us that we really mean it, and also to continue with the change of mindset. Our military commanders have already changed their mindset; they are preparing for war. We need to continue with this change of mindset also in the political part of NATO because this is part of con uh, of, of deterrence. When Russia looks at uh, at our plans, they um, our actions, they will say, "Well, we have no chance." And that the same uh, uh, goes to Ukraine. You know, Russia uh, needs to know two things. One is we have no chance to win any war against NATO. A s uh, second, uh, uh, Ukraine's path towards membership is irreversible. Uh, and third, we cannot, we will not win the war in Ukraine. This is this is the path to peace that, that simply they would be sure they cannot uh, win. We have six months. 
but we can already spoil the Washington summit in the first month. If we do not get the European Union financing for the arms purchases and for the civilian support of the civilian society in Ukraine, if the US Congress doesn't approve the 60 billion package, then, I mean, the Washington summit will be only a polite gathering with fancy meetings, uh, nice parties, uh, but it, it will be empty. So in a way, the fate of the summer Washington meeting will be decided in the next two, three weeks. I just have to add my own, it would be, making, if we want a successful NATO summit in Washington, we have to have Ukraine on a clear path to victory by that time. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your thank insights. You.